Phoebe! Yes, well, of course I heard the shots. It sounded like it came from Scrameau, I'm sure of it. Nearly scared the puppies half to death, poor darlings. Yes? What? Oh, not another blasted ambush. They'll be climbing the bloody walls next. What the devil's going on? Yes. Oh, no. Captain Peake. His poor wife. Last night at the Savoy, I spoke to a man from the war office. He says the whole place is buzzing and rushing about preparing to remove the army from Ireland. I do wish they'd settled this wretched Irish business. Everything is so up in the air. Now, darling, I must pick a bone with you. You say in your last letter that you should have to keep me at home in England. You simply must realise that home to me is, and always will be, Ireland. If you want to marry me, you must realise that you're marrying a woman from another nationality to yourself. I can't marry you if you're going to keep me at home. In other words, shut me up in England and keep me out of Ireland. I've been in it through some pretty hot times, and if things got very bad, I should be perfectly sensible about it. But the ordinary rotten scaremonger talk about the dangers of going to Ireland, I respond to as pure bunkum, and have always ignored it completely. As to leaving me at home, Ireland is my home, not England. This does not mean to say that I am not loyal to the bone, because I am. My feeling about not shrinking things because they're unpleasant is a part of me and has been born and bred in me. Father never gave a damn about what anyone said, and went over regularly regardless of everything. And I have always done the same, and have brought lettuce up to do so too. Irish women aren't frightened of their own country. I wonder if you will ever understand what the noise and racket of Euston means to one with the coils of Ireland round them. The rock of the Irish mail train bringing you nearer and nearer, mile by mile. The sea and the sound of Irish voices, the sight of Ireland's eye. I do hope you like Ireland and get to know her understand her. They may well indeed call her the land of sorrows. What a history, and what a heart-rending tragedy. When you swear you will tear it out from your heart because of a gang of double-faced, soft-speaking, murdering swine, then back come her arms around you in a wave of memories, and you assure yourself it isn't Ireland, not really Ireland who does these things. And down you go again. Unreasoning, maddening charm. The land of bogs and mists and bright, bright greens and soft, dull purples and browns. The haunting, clinging charm that remains with you always. Wherever you go, and whatever you do. Unchanged by the awful things that happen there, you may try to wipe her out, and you see a vision of a purpley, brown, soft stretch of boggy sedge running down to a river with a soft rise of land behind. And then the glory of the setting sun and murders and intrigues.
fade away. And she has you back again in her coils. As I've said before, the mail boat heading out to sea means home behind for one of us and home ahead for the other. I'll marry you, my darling. I don't care if you only get one week's leave. I'll pick it up in the gravel arms if necessary. I don't care what we do or where we go or what happens, as long as I have you and you don't try to cut me off from Ireland. Your very, very own Olive. P.S. The broken barometer has been returned by post to London. At first, father thought it was a bomb or a trick to blow us all up. remember when we walked round the garden, dear, the first Sunday, and you said the winter would go. Rather wonderful, isn't it all? In fact, the most wonderful thing in all the world. It does make one think how lucky we were to both have topping good families and that heavenly garden to love each other in. How would you like to make love to me across a dirty marble top table? I'd give anything at the moment to see you, dear, across anything. But I would like you all to myself, and to put my head on your nice, strong shoulder, and to be kissed, and then to hold your head against me. Oh, keep him safe. Keep him safe, please. Please. Lord of all gentleness, Lord of all calm, whose voice is contentment, whose presence is calm, be there at our sleeping and give us, we pray, your peace in our hearts, Lord, at the end of Today, I went and knelt in the chapel, when it was quite empty. I knelt in exactly the same spot that I knelt in last time I stayed there in June, and where I nearly washed the varnish off the pew. Last time I knelt in that spot, I was so agonizingly unhappy. And now you've changed the whole world for me, and it's all all right again. There is no unhappiness so unbearably painful as misery for something you've done yourself and have no one but yourself to blame for. Last time I was saying, Oh God, do, do forgive me. I can't bear it. Please, please forgive me. I am so terribly, terribly sorry. And this time, it was only, thank you, thank you, thank you for Stuart. I feel that God knows why one did a thing, and he knows how hard things are, and is terribly, terribly sad and sorry when one fails. And he's always ready to give one a helping hand to get up again and go on that he is always ready to help and always understanding. Jesus is so much realer to me than God. Is that wrong? I don't think it can be. He's just alive to me and God isn't. And then the Trinity is so muddy. I can't sort of get them all three into one. Aren't we lucky, darling, to love each other so? It's too big to be just mortal. 
Loving you makes everything look so much more wonderful than it did before. I'm so happy and rested and peaceful inside and it all looks lovely. Do you remember when I told you I hated the sun shining because it made everything hurt more? When I was alone and lonely and restless and discontented and unhappy and trying to live faster than the ache and not succeeding very well. And now you love me though why heaven knows and I love you and the whole world has changed and I love the sun and everything to look beautiful and I'm happy and I hope I'll make you happy forever and ever. Well, you're probably wondering what happened in the end. We lived happily ever after here in Strokestown. And then, well, I died, of course.